Uh, welcome to this afternoon session of the first. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's my pleasure actually to introduce you, Professor José Gabriel Gomes from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he got his PhD from UCSB, uh, University of California at Santa Barbara in 2004. And uh, he joined as faculty member and yeah, UFRJ. He currently is a faculty member in electrical engineering program, uh, copy at UFRJ. And he is interested in CMOS image sensors, image processing data compression, and neural networks. Uh, he has many projects approved and he's a really active researcher in Brazil. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to detail further his uh, resume, but uh, Professor José, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Um, Bruno, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Hello to everyone. Good afternoon. My name is José Gabriel, as Bruno, Professor Bruno said, and I am an associate professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Today, I will talk about CMOS image sensors and focal plane image processing. This is the outline of this talk. I will start with some basic concepts about CMOS image sensors, such as photodiodes, pixels, pixel arrays, and signal representation modes. After that, I will go into some focal plane image, image processing examples that we are familiar with at the laboratory for analog and digital signal processing at UFRJ which is where my research group is. A large part of the examples is devoted to image compression, as that has been one of our longest projects. And then I present some more recent examples, focal plane Gaussian pyramids for feature extraction, focal plane tone mapping for HDR applications, event-based CMOS image sensors, and a software application of convolutional neural networks. And then, finally, we move to the conclusions. In a CMOS image sensor, the basic sensing device is the photodiode. We implement it by a reverse biased EM junction exposed to light. Because of the photoelectric effect, the reverse current increases proportionally to the incident light intensity. A simple electrical model for that effect is a current source, IPD, placed in parallel with the junction capacitance, C as shown at the bottom left part of the schematic diagram. In a 3T pixel, three transistors are placed inside the pixel. The first one is a reset transistor. It sets an initial voltage for the photodiode cathode. After the reset, the photodiode cathode voltage follows a descending line whose derivative is proportional to IPD, as shown by the green waveform in the plot. The second transistor is a source following amplifier that provides current gain. It is biased by a current source that's ex external to the pixel and that is shared by all pixels in the same column when the third transistor in the pixel, the row select transistor, is switched on. The current source and the current mirror on the right implement the current source external to the pixel. The readout point is indicated in magenta. By computing the difference between two magenta samples, we get an analog estimate of the pixel luminance. The longest time interval within the two magenta samples is called integration period. This is a typical pixel array. I apologize for the text in Portuguese that's written in this slide and two slides ahead. On the right, we see that if the pixel is a 3T pixel, then the row select transistor is activated by a row select control signal. The row select control signal is set by a vertical axis control circuit, which appears on the left of the figure. When the row select transistor is on, the amplified sample becomes available for, for readout, which occurs, for instance, at the bottom of the pixel array. The readout circuits are controlled by horizontal axis control circuits. The history of the CMOS image sensor dates back to the 60s, when the first passive pixel sensors appear. In those sensors, the photodiode voltage signal was not amplified, so the images were very noisy, and so the CMOS sensors remained mostly undeveloped until the 80s, when the 3T pixel appeared with its built-in transistor for amplification. 
In the meantime, the development of the CCDs in the 70s with much superior image quality led to a market takeover by commercial products based on CCDs. Willard Boyle and George Smith won the Physics Nobel Prize in 2009 for the research leading to the CCDs. The 40 pixels which appeared in the 90s led to CMOS sensors with much superior image quality and that led to the market takeover by CMOS cameras. Over the last 20 years or so, people have been using additional transistors to process signals at the focal plane. In a 3 tp in a 3 pixel, which is shown at the bottom, a reversed bias, a reverse biased N well to P substrate junction typically implements the photodiode. Because of the way charge is accumulated and reset, which is somehow imperfect because of the proximity between some of the charge carriers and the top of the N well, the relationship between the number of accumulated carriers and the incident light intensity is not accurate. In a PPD, which is shown at the top, the N well is put away from the sensor surface, which is done by the fabrication of a P plus implant on top of an N well. That change sets an accurate reset potential for the photodiode, the so called pinned reset potential, which is physically fixed. Because of the fixed reset potential, the charge transfer after the VTX readout command is fully complete. The force transistor is referred to as transfer gate, TX. This operation resembles, resembles the CCD charge transfer, but within a single pixel. It leads to an overall image that's much clearer and much sharper. This simulation illustrates the 4T pixel operation, including the complete charge transfer after the transfer gate, TX, activation. First, when the reset transistor is activated shortly after the 500 microseconds in the plot, the floating diffusion potential is taken to the reset voltage value. The first output sample in magenta after the reset is obtained through row select activation. Charge accumulation has been happening on CPD, the pink photodiode capacitance, since the last VTX pulse, according to the photoelectric effect as represented by the current source IPD. After some time, the transfer gate is activated again. The VTX switches and the VFD voltage controlled source are placed in such a way in this model that the charge accumulated in CPD is fully transferred to CFD. Using the row select, we take a second sample, which is shown right before the 500 microseconds in the plot, also in magenta. In this case, for simplicity, we are simulating periodic operation with a constant IPD, which means that the sample immediately before 500 microseconds is equal to the sample at, let's say, around 700 microseconds. In the fourth, the difference between the two magenta samples represents light intensity much more accurately than in the 3T pixel. The VIC control exists in the simulation only to set CPD to zero at the simulation beginning. Other than voltage mode simulation, other, I'm sorry, other than voltage mode operation, some pixels may represent light intensity signals in current mode. This is the case of the pixel in this slide, which is a pixel we have used in our works. Note that the second transistor from left to right is not a source follower. Instead, it is a transconductor. Switches Phi1 and Phi2 are used for sampling the trans transconductor output current twice, at the beginning and at the end of the so-called integration period. The difference between the samples is computed in current mode at the YL of N node, denoting the nth sample from the Lth pixel. The, the difference current or that difference current is made available as a reference gate voltage so that this current can be, can be mirrored elsewhere in the imager. The plot shows the output current in microamps as a rather linear function of the input light intensity in lux. To extend the dynamic range, Voltage mode logarithmic, logarithmic pixels exist. They explore the sub threshold time continuous operation of the reset transistor in order to collect a single cathode voltage sample 
that is proportional to the logarithm of the incident light intensity. Still, a different type of CMOS image sensor is the spiking image sensor. In a spiking pixel at the top left part of the image, the photodiode integration signal is compared to voltage reference levels, and the comparison result events are used to reset the photodiode. In that case, we obtain a pixel that fires occasionally, thus encoding the input light intensity waveform into a spike train. For instance, in firing rate representations, the, pixels, the pixel fires more often when the input light intensity is larger. And it fires less often otherwise. The coordinates of the firing pixel are transmitted to a receiver through a serial communications bus, which is shown at the left bottom part of the slide. The receiver reconstructs a video signal from the incoming firing addresses. Because of the transmission of event coordinates, this representation scheme is usually referred to as AER, which stands for Address Event Representation. An example of reconstructed video signal is shown on the bottom left part of the slide. The video representation is asynchronous. As in natural vision, the concept of video frame is absent. We, we don't have video frames in this type of representation. We now move into the main part of this talk, which concentrates on focal plane image processing. The main idea of all focal plane imagers is that using transistors similar to those we have already seen so far, basic signal processing operations and algorithms can be run in hardware, very close to the pixel capture locations. In, a, in the application in this slide, we divide a pixel array with 32 by 32 pixels into a set of 64 blocks with 4 by 4 pixels. On each block, we run an image compression algorithm that involves a differential postcode modulation for the block average value and a linear transform that extracts four AC coefficients denoted as P1 to P4 in the figure, whose absolute values are then encoded by a vector quantizer. We use four bits for the PCM, four bits for the signs of the AC coefficients, and seven bits for, for and seven bits for VQ. So the basic bit rate is 15 over 16 bits per pixel. This is the DPCM part of the focal plane algorithm. The simulation, the summation of all 16 pixel values at the nth pixel block, denoted as S of N, is computed in current mode. The current mode difference or error between S of N and its prediction S hat of N is fed into an absolute is fed into an absolute value circuit. The absolute value circuit extracts the sign of E of N that goes directly for transmission to the decoder. It also extracts the absolute value of E of N, which is quantized into three bits by a flash HD converter and reconstructed locally in current mode, multiplied by the sign of E of N and added to S hat of N in order to yield the average estimate S hat of N plus one for the next pixel block. An example of this block diagram applied to the pixels in the Lina image is shown in the right bottom part of this slide. The linear transform is implemented by matrix H. It is applied to the 16 dimensional vector with pixel samples to yield 4D vectors with AC coefficients that correspond to the, pro to the projections along components 2, 3, 5, and 9 of the linear transform basis that is shown in the top right part of this slide. This linear transform is well known. It is used in the H.264 video compression standard. Component 1 corresponds to the DC level, which has already been handled by the PCM. The remaining 11 components are discarded, which creates, which creates more lossy compression than the PCM and coefficient quantization have already caused, and leads to harder simplification. The AC coefficients have a jointly Laplacian distribution. After coefficient sign removal, the jointly Laplacian distribution becomes jointly exponential. 
instead of showing four dimensions, the vectors are shown in this slide in only two dimensions to allow for visual, visualization. In the center, we show a locally optimal entropy constrained vector quantizer or ECVQ that has been designed for this input distribution. The problem with the ECVQ is that if it has, for instance, 128 quantization cells, because our VQ has seven bits, then its re realization requires the computation of 128 Euclidean distances and the selection of the smallest one. This clearly does not fit inside the area of a 4x4 pixel block. To implement a complexity constrained approximation of the ECVQ, we apply a second linear transformation to the 4D vectors with jointly exponential components. And we scalar quantize the four components using flash HD converters with three, two, one, and one bit respectively. For reconstruction, we use the seven bit quantization cell centroids. A numerical simulation comparing the results achieved by ECDQ and its complexity constrained approximation is shown at the bottom, indicating that that approximation is, is working well. This slide is about the current mode implementation of the building block functionalities of this imager. To save some time, I will skip it for now. If there is chance, I may return to this at the end of the presentation. This is a photo of the fabricated chip. There is a pad and a pin from, from where we serially download the compressed image from a shift register using a peak. On the right, we see a photo of the experimental evaluation board and optical setup. The objects to be imaged, which we call targets, are placed on top, about, about 20 centimeters away from the lens. There is a USB link to a PC, which is where the compressed image is decoded. Here we have some image compression results from a numerical system level simulation on the left and from experimental tests. On the left hand side, the original Linus I target image appears at the top left part of the figure. Right below it is the DPCM decoded result. Only block average appears, only block averages appear in this image. Proceeding counterclockwise, which means to the right of the DPCM image, we see the VQ decoded result. By adding the DPCM and VQ decoded results, we get the reconstructed Linux I image at the top right part of the image. The experimental results follow a similar order. Target image first, then DPCM, then VQ, and then the reconstructed image. The image quality is computed from the mean squared error between the original target and the reconstructed image, plugged into the peak signal to noise ratio or PSNR expression. It's around 18 dB PSNR. The system level numerical simulation, PSNR, is 23.2 dB. So we are losing around 5 dB because of fabrication errors and sensor noise. This is the largest image we were able to generate with our first imager. Its resolution is 96 by 96. We obtained it by merging nine photos of size 32 by 32, captured as 32 by 32 tiles on an array with three by three photos. We can see some loss of dynamic range, sensor noise, and compressing block, compression blocking artifacts. But we can also note the correlation between all edges and details in the reconstructed and in the original image. To talk a bit more about edges and details, we also gathered experimental data on the spatial frequency response of the imager. We note a pass band up to roughly two cycles per centimeter and a stop band from that point on. In the zebra test, pat test patterns on the right, that stop band corresponds to the last three lines of test patterns, number 2.5, 3.33, and 5. At 2.5 cycles per centimeter or more, the DPCM and VQ responses are degraded quite a lot. For two cycles per centimeter or less, the, we can clearly see <coughs> the reconstructed zebra patterns. 
we can see them quite clearly. So this is a summary of the properties of the block coding CMOS imager with resolution of 32 by 32 pixels. The 4x4 pixel block has around 600 transistors in an area equal to 150 by 150 micrometer square, which means that the pixel area is 37.5 times 37.5 micrometer square, and that each pixel contains approximately 38 transistors. Each pixel has a photodiode with 10 micrometer per 10 micrometer area. So the ratio between the, the photodiode area and the pixel area, which we call fill factor, is at 7%. We can read approximately eight block rows in eight milliseconds, which means that the imager can be theoretically operated at 125 frames per second. We have not achieved that speed in our experimental tests mostly because of USB and operational system communications issues. We might try to achieve that frame rate by buffering the images at the evaluation board and reading them later on. But our current evaluation board does not enable that. Fixed pattern noise is at 7% and temporal noise is at 4%, but we have not designed this imager aiming at optimal noise performance. This PSNR 18dB is not, a, is not a high PSNR, but note that the image is represented at 15 over 16 bit per pixel, right below 0.94 bit per pixel. In a vector quantizer design, the partition of the input space is called the encoder, and the centroids of the partition cells are called the decoder. For a given input distribution, 4D jointly Laplacian, 4D jointly exponential vectors, in our case, the encoder and the decoder are jointly optimized by an iterative optimization procedure. They are matched to each other. However, because of fabrication errors, when, the, when we fabricate the encoder, the lines of the partition are off their places. And that corresponds to increased distortion that we have seen in the previous paper. To match the decoder, to the fabricated partition, we feed our entire data set of images through the imager in the experimental setup. And then we use the transmitted VQ indices to recompute the decoder centroids. In this slide, we see the reconstruction of the target image using the originally designed decoder, using the decoder updated after retraining with experimental data from all images in the data set, and using the decoder we computed specifically for the target image, which only works for that image, of course. So the specific case is not practical. It's not, it's not fair. The comparison between the all code book and the original code book results show that the calibration is practical and it, and it, it is effective. Here we can see some improvements in the little in the little DPCM plus original VQ and DPCM plus calibrated VQ images. In the top left and top center figures of each set of six figures, the bottom, the bottom little figures in each set just assume ideal DPCM and ignore the errors due to DPCM because the code book calibration affects the VQ only. In the table, the accept column refers to the codebook retraining using data from all images in the data set, except from the test target image that's being test encoded. The all column investigates the improvement that would be achieved by including the test image in the codebook retraining procedure, which would not be fair. The comparison between the original and the accept columns indicates that the decoder calibration reduces the mean squared error considerably by around 15% on average. After the 32 by 32 block coding imager, we improved the design a bit by doing three changes. First, turning some of the signal processing current mirrors into cascode current mirrors. Second, increasing the algorithm complexity from 4D to 5D linear transform and the VQ from seven to nine bits. And third, modifying the initial DPCM estimate for each block row 
from zero to a more intermediate-like level, initial level. We also increased the resolution to 64 by 64 and migrated to point 18 technology. These are some experimental results. The decoded images at the two top rows have resolution equal to 64 by 64. The decoded images at the, at the two bottom rows have resolution equal to 32 by 32. The VQ results from both images shown in rows two and four, 64 by 64 VQ in row two and 32 by 32 VQ in, in row four, indicate that the second chip VQ allows for a much better edge and texture reconstruction. However, the DPCM stage of the 64 by 64 chip presents a problem at the beginning of each block row. We are currently trying to suppress such DPCM error and other systematic errors via the application of neural networks. More specifically, we are training autoencoders using the decoded experimental images as inputs and the original target images as outputs to be learned. We are now going to see another example of focal plane image compression. But instead of block coding, we now recursively filter sets of two by two coefficients, sorry, sets of two by two pixels, lowercase a, b, e, and f in the upper left plot, for example, by Harar filters as denoted by the forward transform arrow in order to hierarchically compute subbands, horizontal low frequency, vertical low frequency, horizontal low frequency, horizontal high frequency, vertical low frequency, and so on. The inverse transform is computed by applying the same filters to two by two coefficient sets, for example, uppercase A, B, E, and F. As I just said, we can apply the forward transform recursively, again, to the low, low subband coefficients, uppercase A, C, I, and K, in order to extend the decomposition to a second level, thus creating a kind of coefficient pyramid or a set of coefficient trees. Talking about the coefficient trees, we can note a kind of parent to descendant relationship among the coefficients located at higher level, the composition subbands, and the coefficients located at the same positions in the lower level subbands. This is shown in this left figure. A very important empirical observation that was made by Jerome Shapiro in his 1993 paper is that as we scan coefficients starting at the upper levels and serially moving into the lower levels, whenever we find an insignificant coefficient, by insignificant we mean a coefficient below a pre-established significance level, all its descendants are usually insignificant too. And, and so the entire tree can be encoded by a single special symbol denoted as zero tree root. The, this algorithm shown on the right figure is called embedded zero tree wavelet of coefficients, UZW, and it has evolved into ideas for the SPITE, EDCOT, and JPEG 2000 algorithms. In our focal plane implementation of the EZW algorithm, we compute the low, low, high, low, low, high, and high, high coefficients using current mode implementations of the HAR filters. But instead of reordering the coefficients according to the theoretical subband sub order that we, saw in, that we saw in the previous slide and in the present slide, we simply leave the resulting signals, the resulting pixel signals at the same physical locations at which they are generated. For example, the low, low subband is indicated, is indicated by the light gray pixels in the figure. And the single high-low coefficient, HL coefficient at level three, denoted as HL311, is computed using these K-shaped K-shaped routing structures that are drawn over a fictitious eight by eight imager, which is just an example. Similar routing structures appear for the computation of low high and high high coefficients. So we implemented the hard filters in current mode 
for a five-level decomposition applied to an imager with 32 by 32 current mode pixels, similar to the pixels in the first block coding imager, uh, we implemented the logic required for the easy W algorithm to everything at the focal plane mixed with the photodiodes and the pixel hardware. The low low subband at level five is a single pixel from where we start the sensor readout. We fabricated this imager using 0.35 technology, and these are some experimental results. In this case, we, we see the MTF diagonal test patterns, 0.05 centimeter white bands to one centimeter white bands reconstructed directly from the wavelet coefficients that were read out from the imager. The EZW algorithm itself had a few problems. So in this implementation, we in this experiment, we set the significant threshold, significance threshold to a very low value, so that all coefficients are regarded as significant and zero tree symbols are not used. Okay, so now I will make some final remarks, three exactly, about our experience with focal plane image compression. The first one is that all focal plane signal processing ideas lead to hardware reduction. In our case, intermediate memories for storing raw pixel values and processors for image compression are eliminated. Also, the requirements for HD conversion and communications bandwidth get more relaxed. Second, the theoretical trade-offs between the complexity constraints, pixel area or number of devices per pixel, for example, and algorithm performance become apparent. The trade-offs become very visible and they should be studied further. For example, we could design codebooks why not only to jointly optimize distortion and minimal bit rate limits, I mean entropy H with a Lagrange multiplier lambda. The codebook design might also consider a complexity measure theta with a uh, like with respective Lagrange multiplier, let's say gamma. Third and last, as noise and systematic errors are visible in the experimental images, we are trying to improve image quality by post-processing with deep autoencoders that are trained to map experimental images into original images with minimum mean squared error. With these remarks, I conclude our first example of focal plane signal processing. And now we move into a new focal plane image processing example. In this case, we talk about the focal plane computation of Gaussian pyramids, which is a useful processing stage for image feature extraction for computer vision applications. The basic operation, which is shown in the illustration on the right, is chart diffusion among the no local nodal capacitances within neighboring two by two pixel blocks. For example, charge diffusion among pixels 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, and 2, 2 yields the average value for, for the four pixels at the top left corner of the array. By alternately switching S1 and S2 and sampling the grid, we compute Gaussian filtering kernels at different scales. The pixel complexity increases from four transistors to a proposed 60 transistors. We only need two additional transistors for the switches S1 and S2. At the top right part of this slide, we use some linear images to illustrate the computation of a Gaussian pyramid at five different scales with the corresponding resolution reduction in the left images and without the resolution reduction in the right images. Although the focal plane computation keeps the pixel array size constant, starting at 2n by 2n pixels, the number of pixels sampled at the end of each level is reduced by a factor of two along each dimension, as we show in steps three, eight, and 14 of the figure on the left. In the bottom right part of this slide, we see two competing approaches that are considered for a complexity comparison. I mean, a comparison in terms of processing time and required energy. First, the digital approach, in which n by n pixels are HD converted and then processed by a number of digital processors or processing elements. Second, the focal plane approach using the proposed 60 pixels. 
For the focal plane time analysis, we consider the time it takes to perform the Gaussian pyramid generation, noting the charge redistributions are performed in parallel, and then the time for HD conversion. For the digital implementation time analysis, we consider the time required for HD conversion, then memory storage, and finally Gaussian pyramid generation. Different HD converter types are considered ramp, SAR, sigma delta, and pipeline. The ratio between the digital overall time and the focal plane overall time is shown at the left plot as a function of the number of digital processing elements. For example, the red dashed curve shows that in a comparison using SAR HD converters and, v and VGA resolution 640 columns, the focal plane approach is approximately 50 times faster than a digital approach with five digital processing elements. On the right, we plot the ratio between digital, the digital approach energy consumption and the focal plane energy consumption as a function of the node capacitance. Looking at node capacitances around 4 femtofarads, the focal plane approach is around 52 times more energy efficient in the SAR, cyclic, and sigma delta converter cases. To summarize, these advantages are very case specific. And this methodology is a tool for designers to understand ahead of implementation, before implementation, the advantages of their proposed focal plane processing techniques. In our third example, we consider an application of CMOS imagers to high dynamic range imaging, or HDR. Each color channel in an HDR image is usually represented with 12 or more bits which allows for a very nice representation of high contrasts or of scenes that contain very bright objects with details and at the same time, many details in very dark areas. Those images can't be fully displayed in the conventional displays that we have because conventional displays typically use eight bits for red, eight for green, eight for blue. So many details are lost because they, they are located in the least significant of the 12 bits. To allow for visualization of an HDR image in a conventional display, we must apply a convex nonlinear mapping known as tone mapping. Tone mapping may be applied after HD conversion with 12 bits or more and white balance in the mosaicing, which is the conventional digital pipeline approach represented by the block diagram at the, at the top. Otherwise, tone mapping may be applied right away at the focal plane before HD conversion which then requires only eight bits, as shown at the bottom. We refer to that case as focal plane tone mapping operator, or FPTMO. In an ISCAS 2018 paper, we presented some details about the FPTMO implementation for color HDR images. And, and also in the Elsevier signal processing image communication paper that appeared in the previous slide. After the reset signal goes down, the pixel local capacitance voltages evo evolves according to the local photocurrent. Because of the global enable, the control nodes are all interconnected and all control capacitance voltages evolve according to the average photocurrent of the entire array. When the global enable is disabled, the control and local voltages decrease in the same fashion. The VCAT discharges either until V-control reaches a threshold limit, v mid, or until the control signal TXS goes down. The time instant at which either condition occurs is the pixel integration time. The corresponding VCAT value is sampled as being the tone mapped pixel value. One of the main ideas behind this approach is that the integration time is adjusted in a single capture according to the comparison between local between pixel local luminance and the overall scene average luminance. The focal plane gray level tone method image shown two slides ago was computed by the proposed FPTMO and the digital tone method image was computed by a method known as exposure fusion. In this figure, we show results from a few digital tone mapping operators and from two FPTMO proposals. The focal plane RGB approach 
In the focal plane RGB approach, the proposed pixel is applied to the red, green, and blue image channels. In the green pixel, in the green focal plane approach, tone mapping uses only the green channel as a reference for all color channels. In the direct display of raw images, as we expected, many details are lost. A subjective look indicates that the FPTMOs are, are okay. As I, as I have just said, a subjective look indicates that the FPTMOs are okay, but in order to have an objective quality assessment, we applied three objective quality metrics to three variants of the proposed FPTMO and also to 12 competing digital tone mapping operators. The metrics are TMQI, Tone Mapping Quality Index, BTMQI, which is a blind version of the TMQI, and TMO Colorfulness. As a conclusion, we see that even though the FPTMO hardware is rather simple and allows for implementation inside the pixels and for HUD conversion simplification and so on, the quality scores that the FPTMO achieves are fairly similar to the scores that are achieved by the digital operators. This slide is about an overall comparison involving image quality and processing time, using a methodology similar to the one in the Gaussian Pyramid paper. To save some time, I will skip it for now. Our fourth example is related to biomorphic image sensors. They are biologically inspired and generate spike trains that encode a synchronous video without frames, with high dynamic range, high temporal resolution, and low power consumption. In the top left figure, we see a dynamic vision sensor, or DVS module, which fires whenever the relative photocurrent change exceeds a threshold, either positive or negative. The DVS spikes control an asynchronous time image sensing ATIS module, which is shown at the bottom. The time difference between two successive spikes in the ATIS, enco in the ATIS encodes light intensity. The circuit in the top right figure connects the DVS and ATIS, ATIS outputs to arbiters ex external to the pixel array. The arbiters must solve co conflicts between sim simultaneous spikes and communicate with serial external communication buses. The main drawback of this ATIS approach is the large number of components inside the pixel. In order to reduce the pixel size, we propose sharing the, the DVS module among pixels, among blocks of pixels, 2x2, two 4x4, two, four four, and so on. We did some system level simulations based on capacitance discharge equations and video inputs, assuming that the pixel input waveforms can be regarded as continuous. At the top, we see from, from left to right an original frame, a reconstructed video frame without DVS sharing, one by one pixel, and the reconstructed frames with the DVS module shared by two by two pixels and four by four pixel blocks. By counting the number of devices inside the pixels and looking at the structural similarity of the reconstructed videos, we found that sharing DVS within two by two pixel blocks gives an interesting trade-off between the image quality, because we lose around 10% in SSIM, and pixel complexity. We have 25% fewer transistors, 75% fewer capacitors, and 37% fewer photodiodes. We also investigated the critical situations that would appear with DVS sharing. To save a minute or two, I will just say that the individual and average pixel slopes are very important, and we, we return to that later if there is an opportunity at the end. In the last example of our talk, we will move a bit into the application of deep neural networks to computer vision. Later in the conclusion slides, we try to highlight some potential link between neural networks and CMOS image sensors. Here, we consider the specific problem of given two detect, detected objects within an image, let's say, for example, a person and a dog, finding whether those two objects are connected by a predicate, and if they are, what the predicate is. For example, the person may be holding the dog, or the dog may be playing with the person. 
and so on. In this slide, we have a neural network with a visual spatial module that analyzes the two input objects in the coordinates of the bounding boxes and an embedding module which analyzes the subject class in the object class. These are some details about the visual module networks. They can be found in our ICIP paper, the one that I mentioned, the, the one that appeared in the previous slide. One of the most important details is that we consider positional encoding feature maps, the cord cone channels in the bottom figure, and we add a randomly initialized third stage at the end. The residual neural network in stages one and two comes pre-trained from a well-known data set, the ImageNet. One interesting detail about the data for training all stages of a neural network like this, looking at an exhaustively annotated visual relationship data set. In this work, we use the open images data set. Is the following one. All possible predicates are exhaustively annotated in this data set. So, if two objects are not connected by a predicate in this data set, then that pair can be used as a negative sample, which we propose or which we explore in this paper as negative sample mining. To show the importance of negative sample mining, we first train the full structure of the previous slide using only the ground truth annotations, GT in the first row of this table, and then compute the average precision within each class, and then compute the mean average precision map in the, in the title of all columns in this table among all classes. The number of classes is equal to nine, and the class under is very noisy and has only 30 samples, so it degrades the map. We thus remove the class under and recompute the map. We compute the map star over the remaining eight classes. In our method indicated in the second row of the table, we train the full structure using ground truth annotations and the mind negative samples in a balanced way. Looking at the two map star columns, we see that the negative sample mining increases map star by more than 40 percentage points. More than 40 percentage points, while the map star on the foreground samples that have been truly annotated suffers a small penalty around 2%. So uh, to summarize what we saw today, I would say that some focal plane image processing examples were covered today in this talk. Uh, image compression, filtering for Gaussian pyramid computation, and pixels for tone mapping for high dynamic range or HDR imaging. We, and we also talked a bit about biomorphic image sensors with modules for dynamic vision sensing and for asynchronous time imaging system functions, DVS and ATIS functions. They generate spike trains for address event representation transmission. And we also saw neural networks in software, specifically for visual relationship classification. Many other focal plane image processing tasks exist, and they were not, they were not covered in this talk, like, for example, edge detection, motion estimation, and still others. Facing the deep neural network scenario of today, one question that arises, that one question that seems relevant to me, is whether dealing with CMOS imagers, we will be able to cover the gap between the focal plane hardware complexity, hardware complexity restrictions, for example, the maximum number of transistors, and the large amount of computation that is required by the neural networks. With respect to that question, it seems to me that the implementation of convolutions at the focal plane is a critical point. This topic has a long history dating back to local filters with small kernel sizes implemented in focal plane cellular neural networks. But today, we see some papers starting to investigate the successive layered implementation of convolutions that would be needed for the implementation of a convolutional neural network. 
For example, I would like to highlight the third paper in this list. The ISCAS 2020 paper, which is quite a recent work. There are also research efforts on, mi or on efficient mixed signal implementations, not really concentrating at the focal plane, but efficient anyway. We are also investigating the use of neural networks for tone mapped image quality assessment, which is software work. Finally, as a last comment, it seems that the junction between spiking CMOS image sensors and spiking neural networks is likely to happen. I included two references related to spike mode neural signal processing at the end of this list. The second one is from authors that are familiar with spiking image sensors. Well, that's all for today. I would like to thank the organizers of this 10th IEEE Circuits and Systems Society Rio Grande do Sul workshop, virtual edition from Porto Alegre, for the invitation to present the work of my research group at UFRG and some of our recent results. I would like to thank also my colleagues and students at the laboratory for the analog and digital signal processing at UFRG for for their mostly fundamental contributions to the works I presented today. I would also like to thank CNPq, CAPES, and FAPERG, and also the Microsoft Advanced Technology Lab Brazil for their support and collaboration on the visual relationship classification works. Thanks to you all for watching this lecture. If there are any questions, I would be glad to answer to them. Thank you, Professor Thank you. José. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you for the, attending our invitation and for bringing this very nice talk to us. Uh, while we are waiting for a few questions, uh, I have a couple from my side. But the first one, I think that uh, usually uh, we skip, but it's really important. Uh, you, uh, from your work, I can see there is a huge stack of work, like down from circuits design up to image processing algorithms and neural networks. Uh, how uh, do you build your team, the expertise of your team, and how many people are working in those projects? Mm -hmm. It's it is very interesting uh, to work in this type of of projects from from the team point of view. Uh, people, we have we have uh, students from from the PhD level to the scientific initiation or undergraduate level, working both with microelectronics, analog microelectronics, and and image processing and neural networks. So it's it's nice to to see those people doing little parts of a project that all together works. The, the number of people in each in each of these subgroups has has been changing over time. Uh, so, sometimes we have more people, for example, ten, uh, eight or ten people in the signal processing part, and and two or three in the microelectronics part. Uh, and, and other time other other times these numbers invert invert for a while. So it, it, the numbers change with the years, but it, it's usually uh, something around seven to ten people on each side. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was uh, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about calibrating your uh, sensors, you mentioned the possibility to consider some sort of uh, machine learning based or neural network based sort of solution for this calibration. Am I right? And uh, if if I'm right, uh, one challenge would be uh, associated to really getting those data sets uh, in a large number good number enough so how, how do you see this challenge would it be easy to to get those specific cases or because it, it's really uh, dependent on the fabrication of each device am i right yes you're right i think you're talking about the, these artifacts that are showing this slide yeah that's right yes so you, you are right for for training autoencoders to to uh recover or to re regenerate or to restore these images we need a lot of data and we we tried right away with a set of experimental images that we generated it, uh, i don't remember the number the exact number but it was something ar around in 
thousands. It was something like 5,000 experimental images that we generated by hand. And we, we did not succeed in obtaining good results with those 5,000 images. So we, we, we moved them one step back and we tried to use large data sets, like for example, the CIFAR, CIFAR mm -hmm. uh, 10 or CIFAR 100, or even images that we randomly picked from, from crawling uh, the web. But we haven't we haven't done uh, web crawling yet. We are still at the at the Cypher 10 phase, and we we encode those images, we, co we compress those images using our compression system and insert our all, our own version of the noise, and try to reconstruct from there, in order to improve the results. A after we get uh, good results with this type of synthetic data, we plan in the future to move back to the experimental data. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Uh, it really seems to be a big challenge in this case, so that's, that's why my question, but it's clear. Thank you for your answer. Uh, now we have a question from, from Professor Azambuja from URGS Porto Alegre. Uh, mm -hmm. He asks, uh, if you have data on the, the dynamic power of those uh, circuits you have de developed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not sure I brought those data today. Probably, that's probably why he's asking. Uh, it's not here. Ah, here it is. Uh, for a white image, we have 37 milliwatt power consumption. For for a 32 by 32 array. 32. And and do you, how do you think this uh, would scale for a real mm -hmm. large? Uh, it's, it's pretty much linear, or it's it's not that simple. Yeah, it should it should scale it should square it should scale with the square of the array size. For example, here we have 37 milliwatts uh, for 32 by 32. If we go to 64 by 64, that number should be multiplied by four. So something like 160 milliwatts. We didn't bring that figure here. Uh, and also because also here we, we we change the technology so probably even though the the power would, would increase by four because of the sensor array size it probably goes down by four also because of the uh, supply voltage scaling down so it, it's I, I don't remember the power figure for the second generation chip but it it should be around uh, 40 milliwatts as well this is this is very large power. This is not low power at all. At all, and the main reason for this high power consumption is that we are operating in current mode with transistors that are, that are operating co uh, all the time in saturation mode. So we, we are const we are constantly uh, we are const const we are constantly using current from the supply sources. Okay, it seems clear. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Gomes, it's uh, we could have many more questions and a really nice discussion, but unfortunately our time slot's gone. Uh, I'd like to thank you once again on behalf of for the organization, and it was a really nice talk. Thank you for attending our invitation, and we hope to see you in, in South you. Brazil uh, anytime soon. If you have a few last words, please feel free to do that. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure and hope to see you, you all soon in the, in the future. Thank you.